Greetings and Shalom if you're a saint. Welcome to this broadcast. As always, please let me know when you join whether you can hear clearly and you can see clearly so that we can proceed, hopefully uh, being uninterrupted. And greetings to all of you. just to ensure that we can see and hear clearly as I speak to this extremely critical situation that uh, befalls us in this nation of Guyana, South America. Thank you for the feedback. Since it's loud and since it's clear, if you don't mind, would you please be kind enough to share this broadcast with someone you know is not normally here with us. Uh, Many people do not receive notifications for whatever reason. I think that it's a Facebook algorithm and also some devices you may need to have your apps, your Facebook application updated. But here we are. And, um, good, it's clear? Excellent. As I said, please share this broadcast if you know or have a tag or a link, I should say, to the PP Civic, the grouping or Frank Anthony I don't have it so if you do please tag them in this video because they may need to hear the obvious I am in no way overjoyed I'm in no way elated to sit this evening uh, to speak to you about the situation. This nation of Guyana is in an extremely, extremely deplorable state. And the worst is not yet upon us. Shalom and blessings. We thank you so much. In this broadcast, I will be seeking to remind you of some of the utterances, frequent utterances, repeated utterances of mine uh, since March of 2000 and, or February of 2020 according to Gregory's calendar up until recently and you can recall if you followed me ever since then or on the, along the way with, it was first with Valde Lawrence being the Minister of Health and now with Frank Anthony I kept saying to this nation to the leadership of Guyana who I know listen to what I say or are informed as to, about what I say I know that and I was saying to you and this is just a reminder before I proceeded with what I'm addressing this evening that as a minister of health forget the president forget the vice president forget all the others I'm speaking to the minister of health here I said to Father Lawrence then as a minister of health with responsibility for the health care the physical well-being of the Guyanese population you have to take into consideration of course the topic at hand is COVID-19 we talk about the about the the missing persons in a minute you have to take into consideration the state of your health care system can anybody recall the frequency with which I said that from the beginning of this pandemic, I said that you're not likened to developed countries. You do not have as many ventilators as other developed countries. And as a result of that, you have to be honest about where you are as a nation. As a Minister of Health, you have to know what is your medical uh, facilities like, what is the system like, what 
expertise do you have available to you and based on that you should make decisions regarding the health of your population thank you for those who remember I didn't just say it once I said it because at that time Guyana the uh, Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation or main hospital had 12 ventilators 12 not 1200 12 and I said that if there's a situation arising out of COVID-19 because you know it's, an, it's a, a, a severe acute respiratory syndrome you have got a situation in hand which if, if 20 people need to be aided in terms of breathing you do not even have 15 at the time ventilators thereafter the country got a donation I think it was and they were able to acquire a few more bringing the number up to uh, I think it was 35 and the president then of course Irfan Ali said he's going to distribute it across the nation um, to various hospitals so you still do not have even 50 or 100 ventilators in this, in this entire country now although for the Lawrence's strategy because you would have recalled I said as well initially that there's no way that a Minister of Health in Ghana could be aware of I'm not a Minister of Health but I'm aware of Ghana's healthcare situa system and I said if you're aware of what you have available to you or what's at, upon you then there's there's no way that you could be indecisive about, about uh, having the country on lockdown imp implementing curfews and the rest of it because the mayor of Lindham would have done that Bartika did it and then after in April Father Lawrence stepped up and did the same either April or March because it is necessary Guyanese to target or face any pandemic especially one that is deadly with awareness as to what you have available to you you are not the United States of America you are not Russia you are not the UK you're not Germany you're not Canada Guyana is considered a third world country based on its status of development that is a fact but no you all decide that you can behave as if you have the most sophisticated healthcare system so you can lose people to run wild all the time because business has to go on of course Valde Lawrence was extremely was extremely uh, 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 bold in her steps when she, once she took them she decided okay then she's going to do what she has to get done so we had a two week period of lockdown and so on now let me come to this group the PPP Civic they were most critical of Valde Lawrence and the COVID task force headed by uh, Joseph Harmon they were most critical of these people I, of course, you know, I do not support Apnea, I've seen anyway. I would expect the PPP Civic to say that I do, but that's expected. And then when I, I begin to speak against Apnea, you say, okay, then, well, I support PPP. And that's normal for you all. It's just how you reason, which is why we are in the state we are anyway. But the PPP Civic, when they were vying for office, in the midst of a pandemic, the guardians of democracy, in the midst of a pandemic, they were very irresponsible. I can vividly recall in Maruka, for example, Region 1, people were being told that the Apnea is using this as a political gimmick. The PPP Civic were saying that this is why, why you, this is not such a big deal. You're just trying to use this as a, as a, as a tool. Now, once you do that, we should like to, I would like for you to know that there are people in this nation of Guyana, South America, 
who are prepared to live and die by what the politicians tell them. Now, if leaders say to you that, don't listen to Apnea, see, they're just trying to use this as a political gimmick, what do you think would have been the conduct of those people regarding COVID-19 and the, and the, the seriousness which, with which it should be taken? Added to that, I can remember Frank Anthony be, uh, uh, speaking in a most disparaging manner about the infectious disease center that was built at, at Lillian Dahl. And of course, we heard things about being said by people that Granger and his administration just wanted to steal the money. Uh, this facility is a waste of time. In essence, it's almost a white elephant. It's no good. It's, it, it's, it's poorly constructed. They don't have any proper ideas as to what should be built and all of that. So here you have again the PPP Civic, when they were fighting, vying to get into power, they were not being in any way responsible in their speech. Now, as I always say to you, in the most unceremonious manner, David Granger vacated the office of the presidency. In a most atypical manner, and handed it over to, to Irfan Ali. Now, uh, Frank Anthony would have had the perfect opportunity to take over and show Walter Lawrence and Joseph Harmon how this thing is done because he had so much to say that I would like to think that once he stepped into the office of Minister of Health, he would have had at least a better approach and a more realistic way of dealing with this COVID-19 situation. But Yahweh is faithful. And there's a particular way he deals with people that unless you know him, you can never understand how he functions. Frank Anthony, instead of maintaining the curfew period, which was nonsensical in the first place, because I said on numerous occasions, in text and video, is there some notion in Guyana that says that the COVID-19 virus only infects people after 6 a.m.? Because if you have a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew, you, you're, you're implying to people that as long as 6 o'clock in the morning comes, you're free to go where you want, the markets are open, there's no limit, you do whatever you want. Because once 6 o'clock in the evening comes, COVID will stop infecting you. So Valde Lawrence had a 6 a.m. to 6, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew. It was laxed after a while. Frank Anthony came with a 10.30 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew. Now, on average Guyanese, I'm speaking to Guyanese who live in Guyana here, by the way, or if you've been here for a while and you understand our culture, how many of you normally see a lot of people on the streets in Guyana, apart from some special event, maybe holidays or something? I'm talking on a normal basis. How many of you see Guyanese on the road at 10.30 at night? in masses. It's not our culture. Typically, we get home and most people unwind from the day at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, most people are out of the street on a normal basis. So Frank Anthony decided that he's going to have the curfew that Volley Lawrence, of course, he couldn't maintain what she said because it wasn't good for business. He made an adjustment. 10.30 in the night to 4 a.m. While the cases, when they took over on August 2nd, it was 247, I think it was, cases in this entire nation. That's a fact. And it was maybe about 60-something or 70-something deaths. That's a fact. That is called irrefutable. Now, if you're a PPP crony, you could come on my page. You can come on this broadcast, or most of you come on the rebroadcast, because it seems as if you cannot type in, I'm speaking live. So you enter the rebroadcast, and you can see what you want. It does not change the fact that from August 2nd, there were about 247 or so cases in this entire nation. Probably less. What happened now? 
So Frank Anthony is at the helm. And the one with all of the criticisms to make. What happened to you now? You have relaxed the curfew hour to 10.30 to 4 a.m. Which business do you know is open at 4 o'clock in the morning? So in essence, you're telling people in Guyana that from 4 a.m. you are free to do whatever you want. Let the day just go on. You know that many vendors come out very early in the morning to get their business started. There's the only people we know now meet around the farmers and so on to get in, getting the produce to the market. But the average guy who's not involved in that kind of business is at home. But you, you relax the system to allow a certain flow. Then, I can vividly recall the vice president, Barrett Jaglio, said to the media, said to me as a Guyanese person, that this whole locking down this country business, and I'm paraphrasing, is not going to work. You can't just shut the economy down. He said people will die anyway. That's what he said. People will get sick and they will, some will die. That's normal. He was speaking in essence to the herd immunity principle. But the man in which he said it spoke plainly to other people, and I told you before he even said it, that these people have every intention of allowing things to go as is, whatever happens, happens, and they hope that we'll reach herd immunity and things will settle down. Yahweh, I say to you again, Yahweh is faithful because he didn't let it go according to their plan. It began to get worse. Did you think that the Minister of Health, Frank Anthony, changed his mind? No. Schools were closed on the apnea FC because they know, that, and I spoke about this as well, when, 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 of course, the worst thing they did was Nicola Henry, you know, foolish and telling people they have to write common entrance. As if a child placement in high school is superior to their health and well-being. So when they were forcing to get people children to school, I said to you, it is not just school children you have to deal with. They have parents who have to take them to school because you recommended that. You have to take them about public transportation. I'm mean, again, I ask you have private transportation. You have to consider that. So persons who were once in their houses, and if you understand science I'm speaking to here, if I'm in an enclosed environment, away from people, certain diseases will not be, of course, interacting with me. Once you let me out, and that's the fear of, our, of, of shutting the country down, which I'll speak to as well. Once you release me to go back out, then I am weaker in terms of my immune system. I'm more susceptible to things. And, other people who may not have had the disease that I have, that's infectious or communicable, they can, they can encounter it. So after all this lockdown, you let the children out, go to school, because you have to write common entrance. That is the most stupid thing they ever did. But, at the same time, the children after they wrote the common entrance went back home. We know what happened. We know with CSEC and what happened. We know the person became uh, infected. The PPP Civic decided that it made sense. Here come Mar Mar Manik Chan now. It makes sense to them to reopen school because at the end of the day, fourth, grade 10 to grade 11, fourth to uh, or 12, fourth to 11 graders, fourth to fifth formers or sixth formers, it is so critical to this government they love you all so much that they have to ensure that even if there's a pandemic, you have to go to school. Because your education is so important to them. And I've said it, I'll say it tonight again. I told you, what I know about, what I know about politicians in this country, they cannot bear the thought of teachers being at home teaching online and being paid. Guyana's system, Guyana's nature in its political system is that of slavery. Ministers like to lord over people. So for them, all of you, it pleases you to see people laboring in schools. Even now you're doing the garbage by students and are living in classrooms, in nursery schools. And people have to go there to prepare classrooms so students won't be there. Because you can't wrap your mind around people being at home. You all are slave drivers.
So we have had pre Manic Chan, Minister of Education, who said upon the advice of Frank, Frank Anthony in the health sector, school could be reopened for upper school students. That made sense to you. You reopen school. You have persons, you have persons in our education system, you have students in our education system who are in schools and teachers have to keep telling them, put your mask on, sanitize, do this, stop being in each other's faces, all the time. Because CSEC, Caribbean Secondary Examination, whatever you call it, is so critical that you don't mind that in this pandemic people are, are, are getting sick and dying. No. Education trumps that. I had said to you all that if you've got the World Bank projecting and already categorizing Guyana as the third fastest growing economy on the planet, if you have that overhead, by now, your, your, your few politicians have anything called vision. Your mind wouldn't be on CSEC. Your mind would be on, on, on developing an examination that's internal because our Guyanese population is so small that if we are to grow at the rate that the World Bank says we are growing, you don't need CSEC to function. But you can't think that far. And I understand that. The Bahamas has about 300,000 people in this population. And they have the internal examination called the BGCS in BJC. The Bahamas, who's a younger nation than us in terms of, 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 of independence, who the education standard is below ours, and it's a fact. You be don't get mad, it's just it's a fact. That's a, that's a known fact. We don't have the average here in terms of English language and so on. That's a fact. But they have their internal examination because the Bahamas is considered the wealthiest nation in the Caribbean. So they don't, they don't need C-Sec to function. We are projected to be wealthier than even the Bahamas by far. And still, all your mind is on is not developing an examination that's suitable to your people. No, it's pushing children, regardless of the pandemic, to write C-Sec because it's that important to you all. We are neighbors with Brazil. And Brazil, and you know it, most of you in Guyana who go to let them and so on, what I'm talking about, you can both visit this. You can, you can literally walk over to Brazil. And Guyana, you saw there was an upsurge, and there is still an upsurge in terms of Brazilian presence in this country. Brazilians began to come over this border, big established businesses and all that. Brazil is about the hardest hit nation in the world. A new strain of COVID-19 is in Brazil, and they're saying it's one of the deadliest of all. Guess what the wise Frank Anthony is doing here, the Minister of Health? The border is open. The Brazilian border is still open. Let's begin with that. Brazil is our neighbor. Brazil, Brazilians have got the easiest, they don't have to catch a plane to come to Guyana. They get in a bus and drive to George, through Linden, into Georgetown, and wherever else they want to go in the country. Region 10. Brazil has got a strain of COVID-19 that is about the deadliest of all strains or variant you may want to call it. This government has the Brazilian border open when Brazilians can walk over into your country, get on a, min on a minibus, and travel to Georgia. And all you smart people could do is put a thermometer to the hand of the head and say, oh, your temperature is 36.5, you're fine. Because it didn't hit this Minister of Health yet. It hasn't registered to him yet that there's an incubation period for COVID-19. That is the most elementary information we have available. He doesn't know that. From 2 to 14 days. He doesn't know that, apparently. All he knows is that if your temperature 
is normal, you have free reign to come to Guyana. If not, what you could do to them? What, what stations do you have set up across our borders? Because if you try to block one station, say you need to have a PCB test, they could go somewhere else. They can cross any part of the river. And what I find strange is that it seems as though our leaders in this country, I'm speaking to community leaders here, and I'm speaking to the religious leaders here, it seems as if nothing bothers you people. So that's one. The Brazilians and the access they have, regardless of the, 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 the this, uh, I think it's CNN reported or, or CBC, CN, one of those nations, uh, uh, CBS, that there were as high as 4,000 deaths in one day in Brazil in this week. I repeat, 4,000 people died in a day from COVID-19. I think they said that they're even going to have or they've, they've uh, uh, released for 24-hour burials just so people can get put into the ground in Brazil. It doesn't bother Frank Anthony, apparently. It doesn't face Barrage Agde, apparently. And it doesn't face, face, uh, face our president either, apparently. Because business has to go on. Brazilians, if you do not know, many of them are very, very affluent. The gold and diamond dealers in this country, many of them are Brazilians. And there's nothing that is convincing me that this government is not focused on money. I'm saying to you as a Guyanese what I'm seeing, what, I'm, what I perceive, and what, how I'm feeling. Because many of the decisions are driven apparently by economics and not health. You cannot have a situation in which you know that your healthcare system is incapable of handling a pandemic that hits us very, very hard. But you decide that business has to go on as normal because Jaglio said people die anyway. So we progress. And I move on to the other aspect of the situation in which vaccines were donated, donated. An oil-rich country, a country, <laughs> my brother Stephen, good to see you, a country in which you said that the prospect is so great for us, we are going to be so wealthy, we are so wealthy, hotels, Every week, every minute you think somebody else is building a, a $6 million, $20 million, $200 million U.S. hotel in Guyana. Oh, yes, sir, we're moving on. Money is coming to Guyana. That's all this government is talking about, apparently. You're not telling us that in an oil-rich state, you are waiting for donations for vaccination. You can't buy them. So you're not going for the Johnson Johnson vaccine and so on. You, you're waiting for India to give you some vaccines. And for Russia to donate some vaccine because you're not going to buy it. And that's another thing with you all. We've got hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in U.S. dollars in the U.S. Federal Reserve. That's our money, not your PPP, you don't own the money. APNIS, AFC, you don't own money. And it seems that politicians in don't understand that the money that this nation has from oil does not belong to a political grouping. It belongs to the people of Guyana. So because of your issues... You apne are seeing political and PPP people. You cannot see the need. To, I said this to you since you all been fighting before. Since COVID-19 hit us before, I said to you that it is impossible for me to think that APNU AFC and the PPP care about us. Because you cannot tell me that you ministers and opposition people care about this nation, people. And what your best approach to do is to leave the money in New York uh, City, the, Fe the Federal Reserve, because you can't agree as to how it must be uh, uh, disbursed. And if Ali said that he's going to ensure that there are certain things in place before the money is touched, who are you? Who are you? Is that your money? What consensus have you drawn from the people? What interaction have you had with the Guyanese populace? It's our money. And you telling us that you will ensure that certain things are in place before we get money? When did the president of Guyana have so much power? It was given to him by the people, it's obvious. 
and as some of you can notice, I am extremely livid because I cannot understand what is wrong with my people in this country. Something is wrong with Guyanese. You are the most docile of any nation that I know. You have politicians telling you that hundreds of millions, almost $300 million are sitting in a bank in the U.S. and they can't agree. So you wouldn't get any benefit from it. And that has you quiet and calm. Guyanese, I told you this, we have to start the enough movement now. We'd have started already. Enough is enough. Be the movement. These politicians have to get it up here. That you're not going to treat us as if we are some, 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 some stupid set of people here. What are you all afraid of? How can you have a situation in which you have got hundreds of hundreds, not tens of millions, hundreds of millions of US dollars sitting idly in a bank? By the way, you know, I have an issue with this from the beginning. That, that, that our former Minister of, 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 of Finance, Jordan, saw it wise to put our money in the U.S. Federal Reserve for, so they can invest and make interest in it. Because some of the Bank of Guyana wasn't good enough for this. We can't save our own money in Guyana. We are that backward. So now you've got to ask the U.S. if they could give you your own money to spend. And prove to them that your reason for seeking it is justifiable. So we've got pol political leaders here who are treating us as though we are still under master's rule. I'm not under master's rule. I couldn't care less by any one of y'all. You are disrespectful to me. And that's why I address y'all. I tell you before, the, the most any one of y'all could do to me is politics is kill me. Nothing else. That's the worst it would be. And still because of technology, my voice will keep ringing through. Because I said enough to you all to know that what you suffer if you try to touch Yahweh's servant. This is a disgrace. The World Bank has targeted us to be the third fastest growing economy on the planet. Has any Guyanese been able to, can you tell me, honestly speaking, where have you seen or have you been able to feel in your pockets this impact of this massive economic growth the World Bank has spoken of? If the World Bank says that your country is growing at the third fastest rate, you, some of you don't understand what it means because you're not into economics. You're not into economics, I can understand why you're so casual about it. If the World Bank says that of all the countries in this world, Guyana is number three in terms of the rate at which your economy is growing. But you as Guyanese cannot feel one economic impact yet. That should tell you that within our society, there are people who are developing and benefiting from that, from that growth that you are not a part of. You know one of them, most of you. And it's not even one percent. There are individuals in this country who are benefiting from that economic development, and you are not one of them. And you don't intend to fight in reference to having your voices heard for what is rightfully yours and for your, future, for your generations. So politicians will continue to do these things to you all because you don't show them that you're serious about what you want. Some of you are even scared to share this broadcast because you don't want your name to be attached to it. So Frank Anthony is or was brave enough, smart enough to have the curfew period extended from 10.30 to to. to that's good answer. Yes, they cannot even share $25,000. Up until now, persons haven't received the, the COVID relief that you got. And mind you, it's only once. So, call the PP Civic. All you are worth in Guyana for COVID relief is a one-time payment of $25,000 to feed your family. 
And that was months ago. You can't have any more. But we're the third fastest growing economy, though. And persons who owned property, who the, the landlords got 25000 And the ones who paid the landlord rent got a pink slip. And that made sense to the people Pacific. That makes sense to you people. You were wiser than Granger. Remember that now. You all said Granger didn't know what he was doing. So you came in with the wisdom. And in your wisdom, it makes sense to give the owner of a property who collects rent every month the money. And the tenant gets a pink slip because they don't own the property. <laughs> so I proceed. Frank Anthony, as Minister of Health, has begun to see the result of his actions. The mall, the big mall in Guyana, is still open, but you're getting arrested because I knew it was bad. I knew it was bad when I heard on, I think they called it the Good Friday. I was traveling, and I put a radio on in my vehicle, and I'm glad it did. I heard on the radio that you are warned, do not go to beaches, do not have any picnic in the beach, do not go in the national park in these places because you shall be arrested. What I heard in the news, I think it was 94 point something, that they have got uh, the armed forces, the military forces, policing these areas. I said, hold on a minute here. When you, you didn't hear about police officers, you heard about the military and the armed forces. I knew then that the PP Civic is in trouble. I'm talking about the administration. Because you would never, under normal circumstances, go to that extent. To cripple businesses and all that, because money moves you out. Look at this fool, Bradley Nooks. I'm talking to you about, about COVID-19 and, and you talk about debate on my page. Get off. I knew it was terrible when you've got a situation in which the Minister of Health, the Ministry of Health, are issuing warnings to Guyanese people that you dare not for Easter go to the beaches. Do not go to the park. If you want to have a little picnic, do it in your yard. I knew it was bad. Because this same government seemed to forget that in March, March was the worst month because there were 1,600 cases, positive cases, in Guyana. 1,600 in this nation. In March. Pagua was in March. They said for Pagua, you could go outside, but exercise all of the caution Take all the precautionary measures, but you could get involved in Pagua. Well, I saw the Ghana Chronicle report. And I saw persons in the street who had no mask on going to, to, to stand pipes to get water to throw on each other. I saw a person throwing a beer on each other. In the, it was a parade. Even the police officers got their dose. Interestingly enough, in the most in the month of the highest recorded number of positive cases, you were free to go outside and engage in Pagwa. A few days hence, for Easter, when the church people get their celebration, you warn, if you only go to fly any kite, you will be arrested. And Guyanese couldn't see that. Some of you, some of you, some of you saw it, but some of you couldn't see the picture yet. Some of you could not even and still can't see what I just said to you. That in the month there was the highest recorded number of positive cases in this nation since COVID-19 started. 1,600 cases in March. You were free to go outside and involve, engage in Pagua. Throw all in each other, play rugby, because to put a beer on you, in, normally in the Hindu uh, uh, faith, I have to be close to you to, to sprinkle powder in your face. 
That's not social distancing. If I have to come to touch you, put powder in your face with my hand to put powder on you, that is not social distancing. But to go to the beach and raise your kite, don't do it or we'll come get you. I knew it was bad. But I was speaking to you about the vaccines as well. Because remember this, the cell, the cell was, the cell pits was this. Take the vaccines. Imagine Mr. Bell said, take the vaccine from India, it's safe. <laughs> Guyanese. My Guyanese people. What research was done by, let me put it this way. What independent research was done by this Ministry of Health to, to, to give them the, the, the wisdom to tell you or the, mecha the mechanism on the hand to say to you, it's safe to take the vaccine. What independent research was done by Guyana's research system to say, we have tested the vaccine, we have tested it on people, we have a, a trial period, we understand the nature of the vaccine, we know exactly what it's all about, and therefore it's safe. The Minister of Health said it's safe to take AstraZeneca. Based on what? What somebody else told us. I know a few people who have taken the vaccine and are still COVID positive. I know people who are dead. And you could say it's coincidental. I know they say that. But the reports are the person took it and they died. They got the same COVID. Uh, 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 some of them took it and started uh, displaying certain symptoms and were dead. Now, how can you tell me, as I'm, I'm speaking to the Minister of Health here, totally if you have his, 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 his Facebook uh, handle, please tag him. How can you, as a Minister of Health, I am speaking to a scientist, who sh one who should be scientifically inclined here. How can you, without doing any research, tell me that putting a foreign entity into my body straight into my system that would have an impact on my dna you say to me this is safe how because india said it's safe the uk said it's safe are you not aware first of all that Various ethnicities, and depending on where you live in this world, your, 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 your entire structure internally, biologically is different for many people. I thought you knew that. I thought you were aware that given the fact that certain countries are heavy in terms of vaccination, Guyana is one of them. You all want vaccinated people for everything. When a child is born over here, you want vaccine number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You joke up our train all the time. I would like to think that you have enough common sense to know that you should be very cautious then as to adding to the number of vaccinations your, your, your children experience or your population is given. But apparently you're not. So you, 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 you vaccinate po po persons, you say that it's safe based on second-hand information, not information within your, uh, your own population. Not information that you would have worked on. No, what somebody told you. Because I did a broadcast, and I know that some of you are aware of it, and you said, in essence, don't listen to these people. The vaccines are safe. When the Indian scientists said that they've not yet received enough information to make that pronouncement on a long-term basis, you said that it's safe. When the Indian scientists said, the, the, virolo the virologist said, we cannot say definitively that this thing is going to work or to not have a long-term impact because it is too early for us to make a determination. You, Frank Anthony, said it's safe. So then you'll have the rollout. The same Minister of Health now said military forces, uh, 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 the, the, the frontline workers first, nurses and doctors, then teaches you next, the, the, the uh, uh, Prime Minister said it, teachers are next in line. Pre-Manic Chan again. And this time, and it's been the mishandling of COVID-19 here. And this time, we have got 
the Guyana Teachers Union. The Guyana Teachers Union, after they did the broadcast and said, you cannot tell any teacher they have to take any vaccine. None of you. There's no law in this country that says that you can mandate that any adult must have a vaccine. But you started by 10 teachers, they have to be vaccinated. Then when I did the broadcast and others began to speak, you said, no, it's not mandatory. So if, if the Minister of Health and Education had said that teachers have to be vaccinated before school is reopened, then I would like to think that if you say that they have to be vaccinated, it is mandatory for them to be vaccinated. Unless you have an issue with, an issue with English language. But as one who has some degree of understanding of, of the English language, if you tell me that I have to be vaccinated before schools are reopened, I would like to think you're saying to me that I have to take it. That's what have to means. That it's mandatory. Then you said, no, it's not mandatory. You have a choice. I therefore ask you all the question. And of course, Priya Marichan cannot answer me until today. But she did make comments and post this up on me before in the past. But you won't touch this one. I asked you, if 1% of the teaching population in this country takes a vaccine and 99% does not, will schools still be reopened? Because you said that the vaccines would have to be issued to teachers to open schools. So if only 1% should take it and 99% does not take it, will you still open schools? Or will you wait until you have an 80% at least number? You cannot, you cannot, and you would not address that. But... The, the, the Guyana Teachers Union, I, for the first time, and I would like Mr. Light, or whatever his name is, the president to speak to this. Because the people who concern me, and I tell you that, I don't know why pastors are so quiet in this country. I don't know why y'all apostles, prophets, bishops, whatever y'all are, are so quiet. I will speak for the people who, who follow me in reference to the faith. The persons who concern me in the faith. Who you told that they should take this vaccine because it's safe. So there was a, there was a joint statement by the Ministry of Education and the Guyan Teachers Union that the vaccine is safe and they are collaborating. Imagine the GTU who is supposed to protect the teachers and they're supposed to have adequate information before you encourage teachers to take vaccines. You are collaborating with the Ministry of Education to inject the teacher with something that you, none of you are scientists in, in GTU in terms of... Uh, Opportunity leadership. I don't I know of none of y'all to be any scientist. But you mandating teachers must take vaccines to go back to school because it's safe. What research did Mr. Light do to arrive at this conclusion? I'm calling on G2 president to speak to teachers because I'm saying to you as their leader, spiritually, you have to give account to them. And I need to know because they submit to me. So if you're going to have this, this community approach this, this situation, are we going to have interactions and everything else at various uh, levels of society? I would like for you to know that if I'm an advisor to people, give me information to work with. So I'm asking you, Mr. Light, to tell us what information you have available to you that I don't really, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of. Tell us, please, how safe is this vaccine? Mr. G2 President, you must have had some research done at that level. To arrive at the conclusion that it's safe. So tell me. Tell me, please. How can you collaborate with the, with the Ministry of Education based on what somebody told you as a third or fourth hand information here? Is that how much you represent teachers in this country? Is that the manner in which you intend to represent the teachers in this country who teach my children? So I'm supposed to let my child go to school and interact with teachers when you cannot provide me with anything called scientific information that you have got firsthand? What? What, what, what has become of the wise crop of people who once led this country?
Dr. Van West Charles is, if I'm not mistaken, qualified and certified in the area of infectious diseases, if I'm not mistaken. I stand to be correct, but I think that's what he is. So I know we end up at, at Water Sewage, or Guyana Water Incorporated. But you have got that kind of expertise, but because of politics, you wouldn't consult with him. Because his advice to you was not what you wanted to hear in the first place. When he told you it is unsafe for you to have this country open like this, because you do not have the facilities to deal with it. So you shut Van West Charles because you're not talking our language. You don't speak to us. You from Apnu. So Frank has all the answers. And Frank answers, leave the country open. Curfew from 10 to 4 in the morning, 10.30 to 4 a.m. Uh, teachers, get vaccinated. And let's move on. Because vaccines are safe according to Indian, the Indian report. We now have on our hand the obvious, or I should say the apparent reality of a new strain, and this is where I hope that you can hear me clearly. I'm trying to slow down my speech now, because some of you said talk too fast. There seems to be, and I'm speaking what, to what the Minister of Health said, the very Frank Anthony who said, vaccines are safe, use it. <laughs> he said, he said, he said that they have sent samples, 10 or so, to be tested. Guyanese at home, and after elections, most of you have learned of the word diaspora. Guyanese at home and those in the diaspora. Hear me. Frank Anthony, the same Minister of Health who has the Brazilian border still open, who has got the curfew from 10 to 10.30 to 4 a.m., who got the mall open, people could go in and whatever number you want, enter the mall, come out. The same one who's got markets open, you can go in and out in a congested area, there's no proper ventilation in any market. Go ahead and do what we have to do. Business has to run here. The same person, that same person has said, that they sent about 10 or so samples overseas because there seems to be a new strain of the virus in Guyana that is more infectious, it is deadlier than the, than the first one, and it's infecting younger people. The same man is now saying that. Now, what does that mean for some of you? Because you're not scientifically oriented. What he's saying to you is this, that based on what he's observing in Guyana, COVID-19 now is not what it was then. And he's seeing a dangerous trend here. And the trend is that people are dying faster. You have four, five, six people dying in one day. Persons are becoming infected faster. You had 200 plus cases in one day. Today was 135. Suddenly, Mr. Frank Anthony realizes that we have a problem in Guyana. So we have to now send overseas to find out if we have the Brazilian strain, the Japanese strain, or, 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 or what. Because he said it could even be a new variant altogether. Now he wants to find out what is going on with Guyana because things are getting really bad. Now, now, too late. I'm announcing to you at this very moment, it is too late. Whatever Frank Anthony wants to try to do now, it is already too late. Because you don't have, you do not have any technological means to answer your questions at this time. Imagine you want to treat Guyana as though we are some developed nation, so open the country, do what you want. And now, to simply decide which strain of the virus you have, you can do it for yourself. That's how much sense you people have. You have to go and ask another country to test people Gu Guyanese blood to see what variant we have. But you can leave the country open though. But you can do research to determine what, what strain of a virus you have in your country because you have no such facility here. But you can leave the country open. You can leave the country open though. And you telling me the Afen, that Afen Ali can't fire you yet? Mr. President, why can't you fire this incompetent, useless Minister of Health? 
What is it? What else do you need to see before you get rid of Mr. Anthony? And I might sound crazy, but you should call Volder because Volder did better than him. Ask Volder to cross the floor and be a technocrat. You don't have to join PPP. Just say, Volder, come and join us, please. And take us back to where we were pre-PPP. Because you all are doing a set of, I, I, I talk with Guyanese now, a set of nonsense. For you to say that you need another nation to test your Guyanese people's samples is because you, don't, you cannot do it yourself. If you can't do it yourself, it means you don't have the basic means of technology to determine certain things. Yet you want to behave as though you could leave malls open. Why must the mall be open and, and somebody cannot run their own bar? Mr. Anthony, what makes BPAT Mall so significant that they could be open, but as, as, as somebody who owns some other business, can, a, a nightclub can't open their nightclub? Why? Why? Now I see all your little political midgets, I call them, who were once connected to you all after the election and, and uh, telling you, shut the country down. Shut the co Suddenly now people are hauling for you to shut the country down. No, all your all defenses of democracy, you don't have to shut the country down now. You are all a part of the foolishness. Now you see that the, 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 the waterfall or the boat is about to head over the falls. You're suddenly begging the minister to shut the country down. No, let me do that or somebody else. You don't join the party to do it because you are part of the problem yourselves. You are this oil-rich country and can't even test your own Guyanese people's samples to see if there's the Australian virus you have. But you could keep the country open and keep certain things happening because business has to, has to, has to go on. PPP Civic, pride is going to destroy you all. Because when you decide to act, it will be when it's too catastrophic. It already is. The fact that in a 700,000 plus population, you've got 200 people in one day, 235, 135, 160, and all these, these crazy numbers you have, it is already disastrous. The fact that you are now saying, my other point, before I proceed to these, 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 these missing people, the same Frank Anthony said that based on what he observes in this nation, and the report he's getting, <laughs> there are quite a few people who need aided ventilation. In other words, they have to go to ventilators. But we do not have enough. So he's becoming troubled that the hospitals may be overwhelmed. Oh, I've been telling you that since last year. I have been saying it repeatedly. Now, Mr. Frank Anthony, I'm not the Minister of Health. You're the, ge you're the genius in this whole situation. Now you're telling Guyanese that you're concerned? Now? Now you're concerned? Now? Now? Too late. Because once you begin to realize that, for example, you had 12 people in ICU, the other day 11. Gone. The same infectious disease center that you said at Volodorus and them just want to steal money for, you're sending people there. Why? Why are you sending them to a place where you said it's useless? Why? Why you want to send them there? Didn't you tell Guyanese that it was useless and just want to steal money? So why are you all sending people there? What's the benefit of sending them there now? Now, you said it is so overwhelming, you're sending persons to New Amsterdam. You're sending them to Linden, Region 10, you sending them to the infectious disease center now? Then you're advertising that there are 52 active cases in Region 10. And Guyanese read the numbers, oh, yeah, right, okay, 52, right. If the more infectious trait, which is the Brazilian trait, is in this country, and you have 52 people in such a small region like Region 10 interacting, you're all in trouble. Disasters in the air for you because the Brazilian strain is most infectious. It spreads from one person to another faster than anything else. So, if you have 52 people 
active cases, you're all in serious trouble. And at this time, we have thousands of active cases in Guyana. Now you want to cry and say that the hospitals are becoming overwhelmed? No, we don't have a problem because you still have curfew at 10.30 to 4 a.m. Imagine you don't even have shame. You issued a statement tonight to correct some false information. That was a classic. Somebody, of course, in, 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 in their zeal, said curfew has gone back to 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Y'all issue a statement to correct the people and say no. There's an irresponsible statement out there that curfew is from 6 a.m. to 6 No, it's, it's the curfew, according to the order, is 10.30 to 4 a.m. You have the nerve to correct people. Instead of taking a cue from the people, no, you have to fix it. You, you are adjusting the statement. No, 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 no. Do not say that the curfew is still in place from 10.30 to 4 a.m. Frank Anthony needs to be fired forthwith, immediately, immediately, because this country is about to collapse in terms of health care. Before I move on, let me say this to all of you Guyanese, and I've said this before. If any one of the members of parliament, be it APNU AFC or PPP Civic, if any one of them, especially from the government, PP Civic side, is to fall sick because of COVID-19 or the relatives, if you are to go to the Georgetown Public Hospital, I am informing you all that they must be given, especially a minister in the government, preference. So if you have 12 people or 13 or whatever number of people on ventilators, and you have five of their people going there sick, five have to come off of the ventilators and put the five on. Just take note of that. Just take note while you run around like you're crazy and you, you don't want to be serious about this, this situation. Just take note that if you go to any medical facility as an ordinary Guyanese and a politician needs attention, they are given priority, especially from the government. Just take note. Your life depends on it. They will take you off of that ventilator and put a politician on. Just take note. Because if the airline says we're not going to fly you out, or Jerry Gavai won't use his private facilities to get you to fly them somewhere, they will have to use the ventilators to save the political per, uh, uh, individual life, the leader life. They will have to save that leader's life. Take note. They are not going to have a minister in government dying because you are your cousin on some ventilator. Take note. With that in mind, I am asking you Guyanese to join me by sharing this broadcast if you have to. Just hit the share button and post. And I'm asking for a reason. Let this become because, population, uh, because politicians function by numbers. In any democracy, they're scared of numbers. So spread this enough for them to see and say, hey, we have to act. Let this country flatten the curve. It is out of hand. Shut it down for at least two to three weeks so you can recover and move on again. Sh shut them all down. The mall is not essential. Transition, if you can, to mobile marketing, where persons can travel to your community and sell. Give those vendors the right to do that. Shut this country down. Join me in this call. It is it's already bad and you can't handle it being worse than this flatten the curve limit human interactions flatten the curve you would not be able to deal with if, it, if it's a Brazilian strain 
or if it's a strain that's worse than Brazilian strain, Guyana is incapable of dealing with it. It is, you are totally incapable. I'm asking you to share this broadcast, please, and put the title as Shut It Down. Politicians function by numbers. Shut it down. If you shut it down, you're going to flatten the curve for a while. There'll be less infections. And when it's shut down, you'll be responsible, please. Your friend is not that important. Shut it down and stay in your house. And since the economy, now is exactly with your PP people, since the economy is booming to this extent where you're boasting all the time, we don't have a problem with food anymore. Because you can more than afford in this fast-growing economy to feed your people. So we don't have a food problem. Just as how you send soldiers and police to arrest people on the beach, send them to feed people. Because you should already know which, which areas are, are impoverished communities. You know how much help they need. You could do all you have to get done. Flatten the curve. You have to do that. Buy yourself some time to recuperate. Your ICU is already overwhelmed. You don't have enough ventilators. Chill out. Catch yourself, Mr. Anthony. You should be fired anyway. But before you go, shut the country down. I know that the private sector commission is going to be most upset because I know them well enough. All that matters to them is they have business to run and they have the banks to pay. And the banks, you're another set of crosses according to Guyanese. I have to speak Guyanese vernacular for y'all. You bankers in this country need to be dealt with on a whole new level. It is impossible for some of you in the bank to have, you can boast about making $5 billion profit. I think it's probably bank one of y'all. And still forcing people to pay the, the, the mortgage. What else do y'all want? I'm calling on the president. Exercise some authority here. I'm calling on the, on the head of, 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 of Ghana, uh, uh, the National Bank of Ghana here. The central bank. Stop these banks from crippling your, your people. Stop it. It is evil. You have to issue some moratorium. Stop the banks from forcing people to pay the mortgage or whatever else it is. They're boasting about how much profit they've made. Shut the shut the country down. I've get, there's nobody in this broadcast who considered everything I told you would happen hasn't happened because I told you since last year it will get worse and it has. Some of you said I was false and all the rest of it. Fine, but you see what I said happened though. I said that it's going to get worse, and I said you have not you have not yet seen the worst. You are approaching that stage right now. You are on the verge of a total collapse in this country. Shut it down. Flatten the curve. Shut the airport. Close it down. Only cargo jets could come here. Close it down. Because if you're unaware, the reports of people who are paying to have their tests falsified to come to this country. Guyanese, you can never starve. It's impossible for us to starve as Guyanese. We're not, we're not cut from the cloth. We know how to get by. And we know how to survive. Only politicians seek to divide us. But we normally we don't, we don't treat each other a certain way. Now finally I will speak to... And this doesn't require that much time. This increase in missing persons or incidents of persons going missing in this country and winding up in some cases dead.
It's been a while since I've observed this. And I've observed the age, the average range. Many of our teenage girls, many young adults are just disappearing in this country. And I have not heard, I have not, if you have, please let me know. I have not heard the first lady or the second lady of this nation speak to this matter with any degree of concern, with any degree of urgency. I have not heard the president speak to this matter as though it is concerning. And that to me is troubling. Because if you're going to have a case in this nation in which Guyanese are constantly on social media talking about, now they're saying, uh, use your phones to send SMS or SOS messages. You, they're trying to teach you how to use your phone if you kidnap. Your country's in trouble. We are in a crisis. If people are now beginning to say, I can't send my child this place. I'm afraid to do this. I can't walk alone. Your country's in trouble. The moment you begin to begin to, begin to advise people, the moment that you begin to advise persons how to be safe if they are kidnapped in Guyana, you are in trouble. Has anyone heard from the first lady or the second lady or any lady from these people's camp addressing this matter because this is extremely serious. We have in my region, Region 10, a young woman has been missing for at least six days. And there's some fancy story and I just feel like using my Ghanaian vernacular here, some Nancy story about some fancy car man picking up and all the rest of it. Listen to me. The police officers, you people seem to be able to solve things very quickly when you want to. Linden is too small for this young lady to go missing and nobody can give it a account for her. Make them answer. Because you know just what to do to make them answer. She cannot just vanish like that from Linden. Linden is too small. This This is serious. This is extremely serious. And you have a case in which 10-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 16-year-olds are just disappearing. What's the problem? That I shall speak to. It may sound difficult for some of you to grasp what I'm saying, but it's fine. You don't have to. When, and I take you back to March of last year, when our politicians began to flaunt in our faces the disrespect and disregard for law, I announced to Guyana, that among the worst things that UPP Civic, you UAPNUFC politicians could do, is to demonstrate before the Guyanese populace that you do not care about law and that you do what you want. I said last year that you'll have in this country people who will look at you all and decide that lawlessness is the way to go. Because if our leaders cannot respect law, then it doesn't make sense to obey law. Can you recall when I said that? Because it's connected to the one I'm about to say to you here now. If you have had for months, not weeks, for five months or six months, politicians hardcore looking at the law and just disregarding it, as it doesn't exist, what do you expect the populace to do? Because the perception people have is that it doesn't make sense to obey the law because you don't have any law in the first place. If our politicians could disrespect the law to this extent, why should we obey it? What do you have before you now? In this country, it's obvious that Guyanese are no longer interested in keeping the law. Every minute somebody getting chopped, somebody being stabbed, somebody being shot, somebody missing. Woman chopping man in the head. Guyana, Guyana has gone crazy. We are in a dire state. 
I have seen people saying that this suspicion of uh, organ harvesting. You don't want that to hit Guyana. You do not want it to hit this country where people are actually kidnapping your children and taking the organs out to sell it. But I'm addressing here the issue that is obvious. Guyanese do not respect the law because you politicians give them reason to not do it. You have, you have shown them plenty of the, And then, of course, the judiciary doesn't help because we have had, before my eyes, judges who read the law and then disregarded it in this country. In this country, we have had people who read the law and said that you can only have your matter resolved by an election petition. There is no other way to resolve electoral issues than a petition once all of the declarations have been made. Ten districts, ten declarations, then you've got people telling you, go and do recount. When there's nothing in our constitution that speaks to that. Unless it's ordered by a, an election petition. But that's our country. That's Guyana. Where judges in this country, in the, the judiciary, could have abandoned law and do what they want. So why you feel people in this country will resolve problems in the court if they observe that the courts don't have any confidence in themselves either? Guyana, that's when I speak to curse what I speak about because some of you still have issues with my speaking to you that you're a cursed nation. There is no scripture that you can point to in the Bible that I follow. None. Where a nation was blessed and looked like Guyana. If you can, please post it, let me see. Show me it now. Show me it. Show me one scripture where a nation was blessed and has the news, news uh, reports that Guyana does. Amanda De Hart, you can't pray for the world. The world is going to become more evil every day. I would not pray for the world. I live in the world. I'm not of the world. Guyana, you're cursed. Because I told you that in the church circles, at the upper tier, y'all are wicked. And you're evil. You're lawless because you don't follow Yahweh's word. You're lawless. I told you that in the political circles, y'all are wicked. In the upper tier, you're evil people. You are selfish. You are self-centered. It's a fact. In the business sector, you are evil. You do not care about people, even in that sector. Y'all are, are hardcore at the, at the upper tier. You're evil. This country has got a, 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 a number of lawless people at the highest level, the highest strata of our society. You are evil people. There is no blessed nation that looks this way. None. Every day is something different. What I will do tonight is speak to this. Parents, it is impossible for me to wrap my mind around a 10-year-old or 16-year-old or 11-year-old girl, girl or boy, especially females, being able to leave your house and just go somewhere you don't know where they are. This is beyond people kidnapping and all that. I'm speaking to you all about mothers where teenage girls are leaving their mothers and fathers' houses or mothers' house, go to some boyfriend house to spend two and three days, to some man house. Are you people out of your mind? And then she, she's reported as missing and that's when he sends her back home. And he is, he is injury free. So she doesn't have uncles and cousins to deal with this person. No, this is not about kidnapping here. I'm saying to you teenage girls who think that it's cool to leave your parents' house and go to some man for a few days as a third form student or fourth form student. Because in the midst of 
criminality here, there seems to be another trend developing among these teenagers, which, especially you girls, which is to go to find man. And I'm asking you uncles, I'm asking you brothers, if you're old enough, I'm asking you fathers, to help these young men who think that your child and your daughter, your, your relative, could go to their house and spend a few days to have some sex, help them through pain to stop this practice. Because some of them can't learn from words. And if some of you mothers are less busy with other men, your daughter may have, you may have some time for your child. But you're busy being a teenager when you're a grown woman. So you don't even know where your child is because you're busy with your friends going somewhere else to drink or do whatever you have to do. I have a child who is 27 years old. 27. 27 years old. And she cannot just get up and leave my house to go somewhere. Must be some man. Who man? Who? At 27 years old, my child could tell me. I have a 27 year old daughter who cannot get up and walk out of my house. I have an 18 year old and a 14 year old and other daughters under my care. You cannot just get up and walk out of my house. And if you leave, if you leave, I need to know where you're going. And I'm seeking to help some of your parents here because your child won't go missing if you follow these principles or they should, will not likely go missing. Where are you going? First thing, with whom? If you tell me that you're going to point A, you can't end up at point C without my knowing. But some of you thought that this is the US you're living in or wherever you're in the part of the world so you could give it to your children freedom. My children have the freedom to be children. Bottom line, nothing else. My children have the liberty to be children, nothing else. Now, when he becomes somebody's husband, that's his responsibility. But as long as you're under my roof, you're my child. Especially my girl children. I am aware of what society I'm living in. They hardly go anywhere by themselves in the first place. My 14-year-old doesn't know how to spell sleepover. Not to say it. My child is seeing anybody say, who are you? I don't know who you are. She could sleep over in her sister's room or over in my room or over on the couch. But you know see me in somebody's house I don't, and the person has brothers and uncle and cousin and I don't know them and you're going to spend some night at their house? When? Now you could call me strict, you could call me overprotective, but they're safe in my house. If you leave my premises, you are going to tell me where you're going. Once you tell me where you're going, more than likely, you hardly go by yourself. But if you're going by yourself, you had better have your phone to interact with me often. And that's a very important point for you all to note. I try my best to train my children. Have your telephones 
and keep in communication with me. No man, my daughters are don't, don't date people like that in the first place. But if you're on a date with somebody, talk to your father. Don't I'm tell you, put your phone down. No, you, I'm talking to my pa. You send me a text. Or you know your phone will be ringing, I call and ask you, where are you? Are you okay? Yes, dad, you ought to be cool. Or I'll call him. Where's my child? You could call me all you overprotective all you want. They're my children. You raise yours all you want. Because this missing children's story here is getting out of hand in Guyana. I cannot understand how a parent cannot give a call for a 10 year old or a 12 year old. What man of madness is this? How can you tell me you don't know where a 12 year old daughter is? She with somebody? She is with some boyfriend? Not mine. Have your phone. Additionally, none of my children can go to a place where I cannot get to them within, within two hours. And that's a long, that's a far stretch. Either me or the uncle. One the uncles. If my daughter's leaving my house, I must be able to get to you within a very short period of time. There's no way that you have to go to so far I can't reach you. Something is wrong. And I need to hear if the First Lady has said anything about this because there are too many of our young guys daughters, ladies are going missing and it seems as if there's not a crisis in our hand. And the copycat mentality of criminals is that if they see somebody does something, get away with it, they will try it too. It becomes a trend. So this new kidnap and rape story and stuff like that is becoming normal for some of y'all. And I don't know why the police officers are not dealing with some of you in the way they should. My daughters must always be in contact with me. This is no secret because they know it. My older daughter, my eldest, if she loses her phone, she can reach out to me from somebody else's device so that they can't find my phone. And guess what? I can find it. I can go on my device and locate her phone, pinpoint the phone exactly where it is located within three feet you could call me overprotective but that's my child so mr youngster if you feel that she could tell me she's going point a with you and you're in the point c i could locate her phone anywhere and if it's turned off you better have a house to put her in when she comes home my child can't turn off no phone to go with you I have a find my phone feature for my children's phone. It must be found. When I checked your location, it had better show up. Because my child would not go missing and I don't know where you are. What do you have to do? You have to turn your phone off for? I close by saying this to you, again to your parents. The only time my children do not report to me is the way they are is when they are with me. Take note of what I just said to you. I don't care who you are. The only occasion in which my children do not report to me about where they are is when they are with me. Anybody else, you tell me where you are. Point one. Secondly, there are very few males in the world that I trust with my daughters. And we're at one of them house right now. Very few men on this planet that I trust in my children. My daughters are not free to interact with everybody. Thirdly, 
If I don't know you, you are not my child's friend. Mr. Young Man, don't come to my gate and tell me I come for see anybody. I chase you. Who are you? Who? And I ask my child in your presence, who, who's this boy? If you come looking as if you follow some coconut tree, don't come to my yard. You had better come looking proper in front of my gate. Because that is why our young children are getting, going missing. You don't even know who they interact with. I'm asking you, as I bid you shalom, please, parents, your children are not your friends. They could pout all they want. At least they're safe in your house. Do not give them liberties beyond what ch a child should have. They are children. They're not allowed to go where they want to go. Dress them as if they are young girls. Your child is not a hooker. She's looking for some man in the street. At 15 and 16, she should never be dressed in a manner that a man could see all that she possesses. And you, you don't have a problem with that. Dress your daughters like young ladies. There's some sharks out there. There's some dogs out there who have no conscience and they don't have kinna. Now, if in the U.S. you know kinna means somebody translated for you. They ain't got kinna. You don't have your child dressed as if she's she some little, little hole around the place. If you... My child wouldn't even try that. Because if you can't wear what I say, I will burn what you have. My children are not my friends, they're my children. They shall obey my rules. I've told you a long time ago, my children normally think of me as being crazy and it's true. It's true. When it comes to them, I'm a crazy father. I protect my daughters with my life. Because I've lived in a world before them and I know how evil the world is. So I'm not going to expose them to certain things so we can be friends. You don't dress a certain way with me. If you can't wear what I say, then what you have is fit for the fire. I will burn it. You don't dress as if you 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 on LA Boulevard trying to sell something. What you gotta sell? Why what you have to advertise a man should see between your legs for? What you got that a man has to see the shape of your vagina? What's going on with y'all? Finally, all of my daughters, all, all of them, I have to have the password to your phone. Or oh, you don't need a phone if I don't have the password to it, including 27-year-old. I have the password to your phone. You don't have any secret that I can't read. Why? Because I need to know if something happens to you. She was speaking to this individual. So you'll understand why I'm functioning the way I do. Anything happens to my child, I must know who are the people she normally speaks to. And I go into them. Where's my daughter? You see, you policemen are too slow. When I go to you and ask you with my child, I bet you tell me quickly when, when I ask you the question. Because you know what comes next. As long as I believe in my heart that you know where my daughter is, you will find her. I am a father in this country who is prepared to have my life taken and given for my children. So I don't play with them. I don't play with my children. You don't have any password in your phone that I can't access. Or you don't need a phone. And it's no secret. Because I told my children, if, if, I, if your phone is a problem, I take a hammer and beat it. And I'll solve the problem. If your phone cannot be used for a purpose that is wholesome and right, I will take my hammer and I'll beat it. And then it'll get straight. 
Because when I finish the phone, obviously you could use it afterwards. Right? You could be beating the phone up. You'll be all right. Because I will do whatever it takes to protect my children. They would know that my father's actions were always directed towards my protection. And that is why I am not abusive to my children. That is why I ensure, especially my daughters, love being around me. There's a reason. When your daughters miss the father, hate your presence, they'll find company somewhere else. Mine must love being around me. Let them be called daddy's girl all you want. They should love being around me. That's why I live to ensure that my, my daughters love my company because I know how important it is. But I am extremely concerned about the number of our young ladies who are going missing in this country and some of you young ladies who are finding yourself at 16 and 14 and 15 in bed with man. You deserve a beating of your lifetime. With that, I thank you and I look forward to speaking to you shortly. I ask again if you can please share this broadcast, which of course is filled with my concern and obviously yours, as to the state of this country and what we as Guyanese are asking and demanding. Politicians don't rule this country. You are our servants. You're not our rulers in terms of being lords over us. I'm asking you to share this broadcast because I say to you again that politicians function by numbers. Whatever they see in terms of massive numbers, they react to. And hopefully, Frank Anthony, the president and others will have access to this information and will act accordingly. The Minister of Health is incompetent and needs to go. I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the moments we shared. And I do look forward to something positive arriving out of this broadcast. My only hope and my desire is always for the benefit of my people. And I thank you. Goodbye.